possibly... Who knows God in any degree at all could not but be delighted to be asked to come to a place like this and talk about God for a week. And that's precisely what I plan to do. It's what I've been invited to do. And therefore, there'll be no other particular subject. There may have, you can't talk about God, of course, except you relate him to those things and beings to whom he has related himself. You can't preach about God in a vacuum of thought. But mainly the emphasis will fall upon the being of God. And if it sounds impossible, I am glad that some of you are supposed to be here, at least in the mornings. I remember being at Columbus, Ohio some years ago, and I preached at a penitentiary. And uh, they must have liked it because on the way out, some of the boys came around me and said, if you ever get back this way, come and see us. We'll still be here. And some of you, some of you will be here anyhow, but... I want to make it as uh, simple as I can, and yet we might as well brace ourselves for some pretty heavy theology. And uh, I'm going to ask you to do one thing. I'm going to ask you to shake your head real hard every morning. Shake it real hard. See if you can't get some of those cells vibrating that maybe you haven't had vibrating since uh, you got out of grade school. And uh, I want to get them vibrating because I'm going to appeal not only to your heart, but I'm going to appeal to your intellect. I believe that God has made us that way and that he wants all of us saved. All of us. Not only our hearts, but all of us. Now, I have uh, 22 sermons on the attributes of God and only 11 opportunities here, Dr. Boone. I don't know what I can do unless I just telescope them and preach two every time I stand up. I probably compromise and skip some of them. Maybe I'll be invited back to finish huh, sometime. <laughs> now, I want to begin. Incidentally, I'd like to tell you something before I take my text, that uh, there's a song and a hymn here that I... Uh, that I want whoever leads the singing to use it oh, pretty often, pretty near every night. And for once, it's right. And mostly, editors uh, amend them and edit them and arrange them, and they're going to have to answer for it in that great day. <laughs> but the editor let this one alone. He, he, he let it stand the way Isaac Watts wrote it. It's 127. Our God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come, our shelter from the stormy blast in our eternal home. So uh, we'll sing that after I'm through preaching. And I'd like to have you sing it quite often. We get that into our system, we feel better. It is got more theology in it than one, two, three, the devil's after me. <laughs> <clears throat> On the third chapter of Exodus, the third chapter of Exodus, you know that Moses saw God in the bush, turned aside to see. God spoke to him, told him that he was interested in the Israelites. He heard their cry and was come down to deliver them. And he commissioned Moses to go and said he would be with him and that he would deliver the children of Israel. Then verse 13, Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers has sent me unto you. They'll say, what is his name? You see, they'd been in bondage in Egypt for 400 years. And they'll say, what is his name? They were all sorts of gods in Egypt. And they said, here's another god. What's his name? What shall I say unto them? Moses' question. God's answer. God said unto Moses, I am that I am. 
And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. God said, Moreover unto Moses, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, The Lord, Jehovah, God of your fathers, has sent me unto you. This, said God, is my name forever, and this is my memorial unto all generations. I am that I am. Now, there isn't any other topic that could be chosen by anybody anywhere, anytime that is of greater importance or even equal importance with this one. We are to be considering God, the God, the only God, the one God. We are to consider that which is behind all phenomena, everything, all matter, all relations, all laws, everything that is. We are to consider that which, and he who gives meaning to life, to its significance to life, without uh, God, if you take God and all that the ideas that revolve around the head of God out of life, and you don't know what anything means. I don't think a dog knows what anything means because he's incapable of understanding, appreciating God. He looks, he looks, he looks at a printing press, or he, he looks at a typewriter, or he, he looks at a, 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 something. He sees it but doesn't know what it is. It has no significance for it. He listens to an orchestra or hear a bird song or see the sunrise. He sees it all right, but he doesn't know what it means. It has no significance for him. And it's God that gives significance to anything, gives meaning to things. And if you take the concept of God out of the human mind, we look at things and don't know what they are, and we have thoughts and don't know what the thoughts mean. Things have no significance without God. God gives significance to life. I think that we might be able to say, I wouldn't want to try to support this under fire, but I think that I can say and risk it, that God is that which you cannot even deny without first assuming that he is. God is so built in to human thought. He made man in his image, and when he did it, he made it necessary for man to think of God before he could even deny God. So that even in alerting our minds and our logical reasoning powers to deny God, we have first to assume God so that God uh, makes the faces ashamed of all who deny that he is. And uh, this, this is the God now that we're to talk about, and we're to talk about his attributes. But don't let that scare you. Theologians have a way of inventing long sesquipedalian terms to scare you. I don't know they mean it to be that. I, don't, I have better, more charity than to think they mean to frighten us. But they succeed in doing it. They use long words like uh, supralapsarianism and so on. And uh, when you've heard that, you know, you want to take to the hills. You don't know, that you don't think you have enough brains ever to be able to understand that. But uh, when we talk about the attributes of God, don't let it worry you, because all we mean is, what do we attribute to God? In other words, what's God like? That's what we're talking about. What's God like? Somebody says, God is love, and a theologian comes along and says, love is an attribute of the deity. <laughs> well, uh, all, all he means is, that's what God's like. He's love. And somebody else said, God's merciful. And uh, he repeats, that's an attribute. He's right, but he's right in such a stodgy way. Uh, well, let's say we're going to talk about what God is like and what you're going to find him to be like when you see him as he is and when you haven't anything else but God. There'll be a time not far from now when we haven't anything else but God. That's all we have, God, that's all. And for the man or woman who is lost in God, that's all he wants. If you say to a fish, all you have is the sea, 
uh, if he could talk, he'd smile, and he'd say, well, what did you think? I don't want the moon. I just want what I'm built for. I want the sea. I'm made for the sea. I'm fitted for it. God made man in his image, and God is the sea in which man swims. And when we say, you have nothing left but God, brother, too bad you have nothing left but God, why, we Christians ought to say, why, why should we worry? Pity me. I have nothing left but God, but God's all I need, and now and for every world without him. Well, the divine attributes uh, are not pieces out of which God is made. God is not a mosaic composed of a number of pieces somebody set in. The attributes are, are not ingredients that make up God. Now, man, because he's made, man has ingredients. They tell us, you know, in the textbooks that we have body, soul, and spirit, that we have will, we have motion, and, uh, and intellect, and will. And uh, those are the ingredients that go to make us up. You can take one of them away and have the other one left. You can take away the intellect from some men, and they wouldn't miss it. I, I, but uh, <laughs> what I'm trying to say is that... Um, you, you can take the intellect away, and you still have will. In fact, I think that some people, or the very fact their wills are so powerful, indicate that their wills have been eating at the table where the intellect should have been feeding, because they, they, they're, just, uh, they're just over overgrown. But uh, they're, they're, they're the ingredients in which, that we're made out of. But, and the attribute of a man, his intellect's an attribute of a man, and uh, emotions is an attribute of a man, a body's attribute of a man, memory, imagination, and so on. Those are attributes that, that, are, that put together make a man. But you can't think of God like that because God is not made, God's not put together, God is not composed. You sing or play or listen to a composition. Uh, the reason it's called a composition is that somebody composed it. Somebody took those little things and uh, put them down on a piece of paper, and when it, they were through, it came out a symphony or the Messiah or something. But it had to be composed. It, pieces of, of, of sound uh, had to be taken and put together. That's a composition. That's what we mean when we say he's a composer. We mean that he puts things together, and the man that composed, say, the, the uh, Fifth Symphony... Uh, he's bigger than the symphony because he had to be to put it together, you see. He composed it. And uh, when we say that the, uh, God has attributes, we don't mean that those attributes are the pieces that somebody used to put God together because that would mean that whoever the composer was would be bigger than God, and that would be ridiculous, of course. God is not composed at all. God is the uncreated he composed everything that is, and created and made, when made means composed. So uh, we, we were not to think of God as, as being, um, as the, these attributes as being parts of God, because God has no part. You see, both the Old Testament and the New, Judaism and Christianity teach the same thing. They teach the unitary being of God. And by unitary being, we don't mean only that God is one God. You used to, God used to say to the Jews, and they repeated it and still do repeat it, Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one Lord. Well, that meant more and means more than to assert uh, monotheism over against polytheism. Those are two ugly words. One means having many gods, and the other means only one. The Jews believe in one God, and the heathen believe in many gods. But when God said, Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one Lord, he was saying there is but one God, but he was saying something still more. He was asserting the uncreated unity of God. God is what he is, not in parts, but he is what he is. An attribute, then, is not God at all. An attribute is something that we know to be true of God. Let me give you a definition, and I'll use this definition all the way through. I give other people definitions, but I don't use them myself, that is, unless I make them. Because uh, I go to a dictionary, and I get worse messed up than I was when I came to the dictionary. So I make my own definitions. I was over in Taylor University. Uh -oh, can you say that here? Taylor University? Uh, I thought maybe I'd have to say on another network or something, but... Uh, <laughs> 
And I gave them a definition over there of a certain word, and I went through on my definition. Nobody challenged it, but I suppose it's because I was a guest speaker. Now, I want to give you a definition of an attribute. And uh, the theologians present will kindly not bother me, because whether I'm right or wrong, this uh, I'm going to go through with this definition. An attribute is something which, by reason or by revelation, God has declared to be true concerning himself. That's all. An attribute of God is something which God has declared to be true about himself, and which the human intellect has, is capable of picking up and uh, understanding in some measure. And whether God uh, has made that revelation by reason or by revelation, by inspiration, makes no difference. Paul, you know, tells us there are certain things we can know about God without ever having seen the Bible or heard of Jesus Christ. He tells us, uh, David tells us, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament show his handiwork. And David says that the, the things that are, uh, the, the creation declares his eternal power and Godhead. There's power and eternity, two attributes right there. So that there are some attributes which we can figure out for ourselves without any help from the Holy Ghost because God has already given us reason. And uh, reason can figure out, can draw conclusions from um, from premises. And we see a world like this, and if, for instance, if you'd never seen a Bible, you'd never seen a Bible at all, never heard a preacher, never sung a hymn, never been in a church, and somebody came up to you and said, there is a God. He'd say to you, what kind of God is it? Well, you'd say, I'd like to know what kind of God this God is. Well, we'll begin by saying he made everything. Now, what could we figure out without ever having seen or heard of a Bible or divine revelation of any sort? Well, we could figure out that this God was mighty powerful, couldn't we? Because the sea and the stars and the, the moon and the mountains and the plains all tell of great power. So we'd put that down. We'd say, there's an attribute. Whoever this God is, he's mighty powerful to do what he does. Then we would notice how everything moves with the precision of a Swiss watch, never making any mistakes all throughout astronomy, all throughout the astronomical world. And all over the earth, the robin lays an egg and hatches it, and it's a robin. It never makes a mistake and turns out to be a blue jay. Never. <laughs> never. Nature never makes mistakes, or rarely, and then it's because sin gets in. But uh, there, there's such a precision everywhere, somebody would say, i got another attribute. He's wise. He's wise. Sure, he's wise. And then we'd say, well, now he runs all this whole business. He runs it himself, this whole business. Uh, think up another attribute. Somebody would say, he's sovereign. He must be. He must be the God over all, because if he was only running a part of his universe, pretty soon there'd be a collision. And somebody that was running the other part, he'd have a cold war on. Uh, between this God, this God runs everything, therefore he must be sovereign. Pretty soon you could figure out quite a number of the attributes of the deity. Of course, there are some attributes that are only revealed to us in the scriptures and in Jesus Christ our Lord. But I say there are some you can figure out for yourself. But uh, let us get uh, one thing straight, and uh, that is this, that um, an attribute isn't God. When I say that God is love or that God is wisdom or that God is, that God, uh, is, um, is eternal, though those things are not God. They're what your head can get a hold of about God. But the fact is, the most important things about God are not understood by the head at all. I have been in the ra put in the rather uh, rather embarrassing fix of using an, the intellect to prove the intellect is no good, and uh, here I am tonight, show, telling you, I'm going to talk for a week to you, if, uh, I hold out, and you do, uh, about God and appeal to your intellects, and then at the start I'm telling you that you cannot find or reach God by your intellect. You can know about God with your intellect, but you can't know God with your intellect. Paul told us that back in the first Corinthian epistle, the early chapters. He said that God has fixed it so you never can get through to him with your, with your brain. Some of these fellows, I, I talked at a, at a convention, the Evangelical Press Association convention here a couple of weeks ago in Minneapolis, and there were some boys around there. They're pretty wise, pretty bright boys, you know. And I told them, 
chairman was, was, he was extremely bright. And he was so bright, you know, it hurt my eyes. And uh, <laughs> I, uh, I told him that uh, some of these magazines had gone so learned, they'd gotten to such an altitude, I got an old bleed by just reading the thing, you know. I, <laughs> But uh, you can't get to God, you can't get to God, and this brother was talking about the book which is going to come out of these talks called, called The Knowledge of the Holy, which I hope to get out before I get to my second childhood. And uh, he said, you'll run into the systematic theologians on this, and I said, what do I care about running into the systematic theologians? Because they try to find God with their head and you can't do it. So uh, I appeal to you to think about God, and you can know something about God with your, uh, with your uh, intellect, but you never can know God with your intellect. God is spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit, and it is only by the spirit that you are, have the inward revelation that enables you to know God. You know God by spiritual experience. You know about God by intellectual exercise, and that's what I'm appealing to now. Now, um, I say that this is, this is important, but I think also that it's more than important. I believe that it is, uh, it is, it is wonderful. Uh, I'd rather talk about God than anything else I know in all the wide world. And when I say that I am to talk about God, I don't want you to misunderstand me, so I'll try to put a little footnote here for you. And say that when I say God, and I'll say God most of the time during this, uh, rather than Jesus or Christ, uh, I mean the Trinity. I'm a Trinitarian. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible. And I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, begotten of him before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not created. And I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Lord and giver of life, who with the Father and Son is worshipped and glorified, who spake also by the prophets. I quote from an old creed, several hundreds years old in that, and I believe that with all my heart. So when I say God, I mean the Trinity, the, the, the Godhead. The, unless I distinguish, I mean the Godhead. So whatever I say, don't take it to mean God the Father only. I take it to mean God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, in this text which I have read, we uh, hear God say that he is self-existent, existent, and this talk today is on the self-existence of God. There was an old writer by the name of Novation many centuries ago. He had a nice Latin name, and he was a nice Latin brother. And uh, he was called a heretic, not because he taught doctrine wasn't true, but because he bumped a pope one time and got in trouble. It was just a matter of church polity that it called him a heretic. But doctrinally, he was sound, and uh, from him I've got a lot of help. And he said one thing, God has no origin. Now, there are one, two, three, four words. I've preached a whole series of sermons starting on Sunday night and ending the other Sunday night three weeks away and didn't say that much. God has no origin. In other words, I am that I am. Origin, you see, is a creature word. Because we're creatures, we always figure that everything else is a creature, and we figure right, so that we start looking for origin. And we say, uh, where did this come from? That's one of our favorite expressions. Where did this come from? Well, we know it came from something, and that that thing that it came from came from something, and so on back down to the beginning. But when we come to God, you can't use words like that because God didn't come from every, anywhere. Everything came from God. God has no origin. God is the originator of all things. He's the uncaused cause of everything, so he's the original self. And when he said, I am that I am, he was asserting unconditional selfhood. I put that down somewhere in the back of your head or the back of your notebook, that God was asserting unconditional selfhood when he said, I am that I am. God did not derive from anything or anybody. Everything else is derived, you know. You derived from your parents, and uh, they 
They, they were derived from their parents, and so we go back to Adam and Eve. But who, where did they come from? They couldn't say, I am that I am. They have to look up and say, O oh Lord God, thou knowest. And the God who is what he is, he says, I am that I am, and they derived from him. Everything is, 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 is derives, you see. It starts somewhere, but God doesn't start anywhere. It begins sometime, but God doesn't begin any time. It came out of something, and God came out of nothing. Everything came out of God. Everything started with God. Everything has its origin in God. So God is the originating self. Now, unless you sleep on me, I'd like to say this to you. That uh, God's selfhood is simply a declaration. The declaration of his selfhood is a declaration of his holy being. Do you ever think that God loves himself with perfect, sinless, holy, impeccable love? God loves himself sinlessly and purely and perfectly. But you wonder how God can love himself and you're not permitted to love yourself. Well, the answer is that God has no origin. I am that I am. And God is all he is in himself, whereas you derived from God. You came out from God. And when you start loving yourself, you're loving the, the, wrong, the wrong person, you see. You're not supposed to love your little self. Your little self derived from the big self. When we say, I am, and mean God, we put it in capital letters. But when we say, I am, and mean us, we put it in lowercase letters, except the pronoun I. But God allows us to say, I am, in a, in a hushed voice, because he said, I am, in a loud voice. He permits me to say, I am, because he said, I am. The great I am made us in his image. Therefore, I've never been afraid of the personal pronouns. Some people are awfully afraid of the personal pronouns, you know. They say we all the time. They never say I. I don't know. I, I hear these brethren, and I wonder about where, where, where they're going. <laughs> the fellow gets up and writes me a letter, and he says, We will be arriving by plane TCA 305-251. I wonder if he's bringing his family or just his wife. And when I go to meet him, he's just there all by himself. And yet he said, we, I told him at council last year that the only fellow that had any right to call himself we was a fellow who had a tapeworm. <laughs> and uh, if he, uh, yes, uh, <clears throat> if he, uh, he wanted to get chummy and refer to his little pal and say, we, it's perfectly all right with me. But uh, God will... God will understand what you mean when you say I, so don't be afraid of saying it. Just say it and know it's lowercase. Say it down, see. It isn't the unoriginate, unoriginating, uh, the original I, but it's the, it's the I that's originated. You've come from God. God came from nobody. God was. God is. God will be. God lives forever in himself, the holy selfhood of God. But he made you. And because he made you in his image, he said, now you can say self, too. And you can say I, too. And you can say, I love God. I love God. You can say it because, you see, God made you like that. But he wanted you to understand that you were to take the position always remembering you originated somewhere and God didn't. That uh, you came from and God didn't come from that uh, you're a, a derived self and God is an underived self. You're a created self and God is the uncreated self. And uh, God can love himself with perfect sinless devotion because he is what he is. And God was before any creatures were. I wondered why God created the heaven and the earth and all things that are therein. And the theologians try to tell us why, but they don't know either. And I'm sure nobody knows quite. But long before there was anything, God existed, and uh, the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost were there. You ever hear this old argument for the Trinity given by the old church fathers? Sometimes I wonder why anybody ever reads anything written in the last hundred years or last fifty years, except, of course, my books, but um, <laughs> I, um, we, we 
get all mixed up about this. Why did God create things? Well, God didn't need us. He didn't need us. The old, old fellows way back there, they said this. They said, God the Eternal Father, being perfect love, being love, had to pour himself out on some object because love has to have an object. Love must have an object. Therefore, the eternal generation of the Son and out of the substance of the Father, the eternal Son was generated. And uh, therefore, God could pour himself out upon the Son. And said the old writers, in order that God might pour himself out upon an object, the object had to be equal to the one who poured it out. Therefore, God had to have someone equal to himself upon which he could pour out his undiluted and unrestrained love, and so the eternal Son is equal to the eternal Father, co-eternal and co-equal. But, said the old writers, in order that the eternal Father could pour out unqualified love upon the eternal Son, there had to be someone capable of carrying that love from the heart of the Father to the heart of the Son, so there's the Holy Spirit. And so they have Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, the Father loving the Son with eternal love, and the Son returning the Father with eternal and qualified love, and the Holy Ghost being what they call the bond of the twain. Now, if that's hard on your head, brother, shake it good, because that's great stuff, you know. That'll help you long after you've forgotten about that religious fiction you shouldn't have been reading. But uh, that, that'll do you good, just to know that. Just to know that, that'll, that'll do you a lot of good. Well, what's the matter then with us? Why, why is it wrong for us? Why is our trouble selfishness? Well, we sin. We sinned and we broke off from God. We sinned and we took the place. We took the, the high place of self. And we put God down. Instead of our taking the low place and putting God up, we took the high place and put God down. And we push God around and, and make a pet out of him and use him and run to him for help when we're in trouble and forget him when we're not. And uh, thus the God, we put God where we belong and we take the place that, where that God uh, should have by right. And that's what's the matter with the world. We're all mixed up. We're upside down. We're sitting on the throne that God should sit on. And uh, we're trying to make God Almighty kneel in front of us. That's why it's wrong to be selfish. And that's why self is the essential sin of the world. Because it is putting my created self upon the throne of my heart where only the Creator belongs. Now, the essence of sin is independent self. That's the essence of sin. Your sin has all sorts of symptoms, you know, but the essence in the bottle, the poisonous, terrible essence in the bottle is sin itself. And wherever it flows out, it curses. In the book of Ezekiel, Dr. Simpson used to make a great deal in his sermons about the Ezekiel River that flowed out from under. There was the throne of the altar that flowed out, and everywhere it went, everything lived. But self is a river that flows out from under the hills of sin, and wherever it goes, everything dies. That's why we have cold wars, and that's why we have robberies, and that's why we have all the sins that we have. Coming up the driveway, Mr. Becker brought us up and coming up, he sh they showed us, uh, it was clear, and they showed us sing, sing. And I commented that it's too bad these fellas this can't be good. They have to be put there. Why do they have to be put there? Self did it. And uh, you're, you have the same thing in you, too, only that you manage to stay inside the law. Your, your self is legal. Their self got illegal and they got chucked away. But still self. It's a curse everywhere. That's why husband and wife can't get along. That's why kids bust each other's noses and bloody their knuckles over each other's growing up in the same home. And that's why when you ask streetcar conductor where to transfer, you'd think that, that you'd insulted him. People are mean, nasty. And why? Because self has taken over, you see. Myself, me, myself. Forgetting that God, the eternal self, has created us as, as satellites to circle around him, drawing from him the magnetism that holds us to him, drawing from him the light and the warmth 
drawing from him all significance and meaning, but we insist upon being sons in our own right, and everything revolves around us. We make everything revolve around us. That's why we're such sinners. That's why, that's why we have to have all the calls and get people down on their knees and say, now ask God to help slay yourself. I was somewhere, I wouldn't tell you where for the world, and if it slipped out, I didn't say it. But I was somewhere not so long ago, and there was a preacher from another denomination there. He might have been from the Alliance, but he happened to be from another denomination. And I never was, I never haven't talked for years for such a brassy fellow as he was. He was a wonderful fellow. He was liberal, and he knew where I stood, so he told me about being born again, and he used the language of the of the evangelical, you know, to butter me up. But, oh, brother, I'd never met him before, and he raced across a lobby and grabbed me, Dr. Tozer. And he, he gave me all the old Carnegie treatment of how to win friends and influence people, and I haven't seen self so naked. You know, mostly we Alliance people, we, we put our, our house coat on at least before we go to the door. Uh, and when we, we are selfish and this comes out, at least we cloak it. We say, we call it, we use some nice religious terms to keep from standing in our sheer selfish nakedness. But he was sheer naked. He didn't have a stitch on. <laughs> and uh, that self of his, I, have, I, have, I was repulsed by it, repulsed by this self of his. Oh, what a man he'd have made if God only could have killed him, you know, and gotten rid of that self of his. Why is self such a sin? It's because... God is the self. It is God alone who can stand and say, I am that I am. And we must say, I am because he is. And uh, I am what I am because he is as he is. And when we put God where he belongs and we take the place that we belong, we put him on the throne and we kneel before the throne, then peace returns to our heart and peace comes to the kingdom of man's soul and then everything straightens out and uh, we're all right. And we're a fellowship with God and God's pleased and the smile of God's on us because we've taken our right place, you see. But we don't like to do that. We like to say, I, I, I. I picked up a magazine the other day and again, I don't, won't even tell you what country I was in. It wasn't Mexico, but it's somewhere. And... Uh, uh, it was a magazine, 20-page magazine, put out by a man, and I went through it, and I saw, and out my own two little eyes, the help of my bifocal, I actually saw myself 14 pictures of that man on 20 pages. And he teaches a deeper life. Deeper than what? I'd like to know. Deeper than what? Dr. Simpson, I guess, is about 60 years old before he'd let him take his picture. You know, he wouldn't have it. He didn't want it. He didn't want his picture around everywhere. This fellow splashes his around, just butters up the world with it. Well, brothers and sisters, uh, only God can stand there and say, I am that I am. I am the self-existent one. I am the one that has no origin. I am the one that came from nowhere. I am the one that loved myself. I am the one the Father loves the Holy Ghost, and the Holy Ghost loves the Father and the Son, and so these hold this holy Godhead glows with its incandescent love, and then in love pours itself out upon us and says, Now I give, and give you my likeness, and I give, give you a self, a little self, a little self, and I pour my great self out on you and make you glow too, and I will let you shine in my love. But always remember that if I, with, I just withdraw myself from you and you go out like a spark. Always remember, God might say, that you are like a sun ray that shines down from the sun. But as soon as something is put up between me and the sun, the sun ray instantly dies. Well, the woe of the proud man, the self man, the man who is taking the place where God belongs. Now I want to tell, just give you two scripture verses, say a few, make a few inane comments and quit. I want to tell you about that passage back in the book of Isaiah, which I consider to be the most perfect definition of sin ever found in the scriptures. 
We have, let's turn to it, Isaiah 53, 6. Isaiah 53, 6. I want you to see here how this man of God defines sin. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. Now, I believe that this is a perfect definition of sin, not a complete one, but perfect as far as it goes. We have turned every one to his own way. Every little self has cut itself loose from the eternal self and is out on its own, not obeying the source of its being, not uh, communing with the unoriginated original from whence it flowed, but out on its own, uh, turning everyone to his own way. And isn't that, after all, the way sinners are? We sinners were not all alike, alike because not everybody wants to go the same way. But the point is, no matter which way you go, the fact that it is your way instead of God's way makes it sin. We have turned everyone to his own way. Self has seen to that. And that is why our Lord Jesus Christ would say, he that would save his life must lose it, and he that loses his self for my sake will find it. And that's why he would say, take up his cross and deny himself and follow me. That's the philosophy of the cross, you see, my brethren. That you must die by the cross of Christ to yourself is not something that somebody stuck on, John Wesley or A.B. Simpson. It's not simply a view of Christianity. There's a philosophy underneath it all. There's a reason for this. Yourself has to die and cease to be its selfish self. And the only way it can die is to die on a cross. Therefore, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And where I am, there will my servant be. Up from his stony grief, God will raise us and give us power and life. And if we refuse to die, we're like a corn of wheat that falls into the ground and remains without fruit. But if we will die, I die to self. You know, the odd thing about it is, I've painted self as a very ugly thing, but self isn't ugly at all. Self is a very pretty thing, a very lovely thing. And the, uh, the cosmeticians and manufacturers of pretty nup stuff, they know that self is a pretty thing. And uh, we men, we have men, those who also uh, cater to us and make millions of dollars a year because we, we love ourselves. People love themselves. You can always, by appealing to a man's pride, you can always sell him something. I had a goofy brother-in-law who, uh, who was the one who wanted to be a salesman. I don't think he ever managed to sell anything, but he was learning how, and he, he said, they told him, they said, you go to the, the door, and uh, if a lady comes to the door, smile and say, good morning, miss, is your mother at home? And uh, he said, you sell it all right. Why, you know, you're kind of puffing the old gal up a little bit and uh, making her think she looks so young. I had to explain that to you, Andrew, I see. But uh, that, 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 that's it, you see. And they, 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 they sell, they sell us, they, they sell us stuff we don't need because self is there. 